Up until this very day, I think one of the biggest efforts that you can have as an entrepreneur is to be a bit of naive. So, you know, na good naive, smartness, naivety, and optimism are a really strong combination because if you know everything, you tend to overthink and overcomplicate. This episode is brought to you by WHU, the Otto Beisheim School of Management. WHU is reshaping the way students learn about business, management, finance, and entrepreneurship through its innovative programs and partnerships in Germany and across the globe. To learn more about this globally ranked university, visit whu.edu today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Most Awesome Founder Podcast. I'm your host, Ries Fams, and today I'm thrilled to have again with me Garrett McGowan as the co-host for this exciting new episode. The person that we have with us today is Roman Kirsch, a celebrated digital entrepreneur, a savvy investor, and an inspiring alumnus of the WAU Otto Beisheim School of Management. In this episode, we delve deeper into Roman's roller coaster experiences with creating and investing in startups. So without further ado, let's jump into the stimulating dialogue with Roman about the opportunities and challenges that lie within the realm of digital entrepreneurship. Coming to you from WHU, on the banks of the Rhine River, in beautiful Fallendar, Germany, this is the best and most awesome founder podcast. A show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. Roman, welcome to the Most Awesome Founder podcast. Thanks. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And I'm uh, very excited to uh, get the chance to spend an hour with, with both of you. Great. Now, as you might know, we always kick off in the same way. So we always give the floor to our guest to briefly do some storytelling on some background, um, where you're coming from, what have been your kind of core experiences. So I would say the floor is yours. Yes, th thanks a ton. Well, um, where do I start? I actually, um, you know, always have been um, by coincidence, I guess, entrepreneurial, Yeah, even before I knew what entrepreneurship actually means. So, uh, you know, at school, I was, I was really loving to, you know, sell all my um children's kids products you know all the things that i have kind of in my home or um or uh, you know panini cards um on the flea market so i was always uh you know driving in this trading environment um but I actually had no idea what it means to become an entrepreneur and that's i think where and um, the university whu came in um like perfect occurrence because that's uh, the first time where i met really people who, who started companies, who built companies, who scaled them, um, and all of that in the sphere of, of the tech, in, um, of the, you know, beginning uh, tech industry. That was around 2007, eight, um, when I actually started uh, started uh, studying at, at the university. And um, before that, I had zero idea about what consulting means, what investment banking okay. means, what, you know, entrepreneurship means. Um, up until this very day, I think one of the biggest efforts that you can have as an entrepreneur is to be a bit of naive. So, you know, na good na smartness, naivety, and optimism are a really strong combination <laughs> because if you know everything, you tend to overthink and overcomplicate. So I was definitely naive going into this. Um, and, um, yeah, um, you know, when you always have those company presentations or those founder presentations at, at the university and, um, I looked at the people and one of the things that I always did for myself is to look at the people who are all 10, 15 years older than you and, you know, try to envision myself being in, in, in those shoes and say, okay, if I'm te 10 years from now, do I want to be like that person? No. And uh, the first time I really, I really had that, uh, you know, epiphany was with uh, tech founders and you know, and the consultants came and said, okay, yeah, that's cool, but it doesn't really uh, uh, connect with me and um, when we had I think it was the, the guys uh, Robert who, who did Salando, um who also just got out of university and, and came to to, to recruit um, and uh, talked about what he's doing with so much passion and fire in the eyes 
I said, damn, you know, five or 10 years from now, that's what I should be probably doing. And, um, so, so that was kind of more, more the emo emotional, uh, uh, um, side where, where I felt that I'm, you know, uh, that I shouldn't be going into this. Yeah. Uh, the, the more practical reason was that if you're an 18 or 19 year old, it's the best way to get an internship because no bank will ever take you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but both together came in handy and I started uh, doing internships here and there. And uh, maybe that's also because you, you, you were asking uh, beforehand about advice or wisdom. I think that's also one of the things that I would give a lot of young, young people as an advice is to really um, not optimize for the most salary as an intern or, you know, um, or kind of the biggest name, I think for, for me, what gave me, what, what gave me the best insights was just to surround myself with really, um, you know, um, entrepreneurs who I also at some point in time then later on cons considered and until this very day consider as my mentors where I learned a lot and of course got access to their network, but really, I, um, I think part of half of the internships I even did for free. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just because I wanted to learn. And I think um, that came in really handy also later on when, when it came to, you know, raising the first money for the first company and so on and so forth, I was just asking for advice. And um, yeah, so um, so then I did those internships. And mm -hmm. to be honest, after the first or second or third, um, you all also get into internships um, uh, where it's if everything's going smooth, you kind of don't realize why it's going smooth. But also, obviously, the beauty about a lot of tech startups, especially the beginning, is that nothing goes smooth. Mm. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so um, I real I realized for me right away, um, you know, all of those guys are really smart. But if they can do it, I can also hopefully do it. And that's you know um, why why is okay. Um, and probably unemployable after uh, <laughs> after after having uh, had access to to this entrepreneurship life, and um, I'm going to start my first business right after uni. Yeah, and that's uh, so that was then in I think 2012 when you kind of founded uh, Kanda. 2011. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, 2011, 2011 actually. Yeah. So I, I graduated from W2 2010, and mm -hmm. um, to be perfectly honest, I just didn't have an idea of what to do. So I, okay. I, I looked up um, what kind of business to start. So I looked up actually um, um, master uh, master of science um, classes. And I think the WHU one was 18 months. And I, I said, that's too long for me. What's the <laughs> shortest master's <laughs> class? And that was at LSE nine months. Okay. <laughs> so I said, okay, nine months, I can do that. And in this nine months, I have to come up with an idea. So actually from the very first day, I booked myself into the same room at university and just literally uh, looked at business ideas and business ideas. And I think after four, five, six months, um, there's been a few, um, um, I ended up um, in, in, you know, being fascinated by the concept of shopping, shopping clubs. Um, and, and back then there's been a big wave, the first wave of really shopping clubs um, for a fashion um, brand, so for fashion products. And for those of you that don't know that, back in the day, Shopping Club was basically you sign up, you can, and um, it's basically like an online outlet. You sign up with your email address, and every day you get um, an email with you know a handful of brands um, that were selling their overstock um, mm. for 30, 40, 50, 60% off. So you can get an Adidas sneaker for 50, 60% off. And um, and the reason why the brands did it in the fashion space, at least, was because they had overstock, but they didn't want to push it publicly. So uh, you create you created um, you know this closed club concept. No. And I found it interesting. And um, at the same time, what what, uh, what I said, okay, you know, fashion is probably a done field, and I started looking okay, what are actually other big verticals, and came quickly to the whole like the second biggest vertical that was online then was. Uh, furniture and home decor design products. And um, that's actually, um, you know, what, what, uh, what I started digging into. Um, after two, three months, we kind of stumbled upon one business in the US, Parking Stain, that did something similar in that space. And um, every morning I would get up, see what they would push uh, live 
you could always uh, track how many things got sold. So that was mm. before similar web and all of this uh, data that you can have access to. And then basically did a, an Excel list. And so every day we kind of knew what they were selling in terms of revenue. So that we had a really good, uh, really good, uh, you know, idea of the trajectory. And so, wow, this is growing like crazy. Yeah. And, and as um, I understood, yeah. you were actually kind of competing with the Zander brothers, not they had their own. That was, that was active... later. Yeah, that was later. Okay, that was yeah, later. So, so, so basically, so basically, um, when so so that was still in London, and um, so I think in 2011, around the summer, um, we basically said, "Okay, we got to do this." I called two of my friends from university that I, that I graduated with. Okay. One was actually studying, also doing a master, and the other, the the third, the third one, Sasha, was actually. At, already having one year of work experience. He was the only one of us who ha actually had done some online stuff. He was there uh, with Rocket doing online marketing. Um, and called them up and said, you know, guys, this is the idea. This is the pitch. I think that was a Thursday. Um, if you like it, give me a heads up if you're in until tomorrow. Um, book your flight because Monday we have our first pitch. Okay. <laughs> um, and Friday morning they said okay let's do it flew into London we had our first pitch on Monday with with uh, with a business angel Stefan Glenza and he liked us he did not end up investing um, but uh, from then then on we basically started pitching every single week with, with angels and investors and back in the days there wasn't like a big amount of mm. people who would be investing maybe 50 a 60 angels or so so no one had money it was like a very nascent young industry and um, but it was still interesting times because you had always those easy jet flights at 6 a.m to berlin or munich or whatever and then i would go, get, get back at 4 p.m or so do maybe an exam um and then Next day, another exam on, on 9 a.m. and then get it to those awful London Luton airports or whatever <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, to fly somewhere else. Yeah, Roman, um, I, I'd like to, can I yeah. jump in and ask you something well, about yeah. this? Because um, you're, uh, you're bringing back a lot of memories for me. Um, I yeah. built my first venture back company in 2010. And okay. uh, I went through hundreds, easily hundreds of pitches. Um, you know, such a big part of building a venture is, of, of course, your team and your USP and all these things, but but timing really matters too. You launched uh, a venture, arguably dead smack in the bit in the middle of a big recession. Um, there wasn't a lot of capital around. I mean, I think I actually launched my company in Mintian, ended up moving it back to the U.S. because um, there just wasn't a lot of angel capital mm -hmm. in Germany in general. Plus, it was yeah. in kind of a contractive environment. How was that for you in terms of, of timing? And did you have any reservations doing this uh, um, because of challenges of raising capital? Or did you tap into the network really easily and find first capital? Look, I could give you a really smart as answer to that now. But the honest truth is we are just so laser focused and not even like we like the economy didn't even come as a afterthought to us. We were like, we're going to do this no matter if the world basically breaks down, we're still going to do it. We didn't even think about any external factors. And yes, of course it was, it was, it was tough to, to, to raise that money, but, um, you know, it, it, it was just not, it was really not even an afterthought for us uh, because we are, you know, failing was not even an option. We didn't have a plan B yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, which, which I think comes back to this na naivety and optimism, uh, argument at the very, very beginning. Um, and yeah, so, so I think, uh, we, we still didn't get, didn't have any positive feedback, uh, when, when we actually moved to Berlin So we moved to Berlin then after one and a half month after we finished our studies, I finished my studies, uh, rented an office, um, which also served, had a second uh, purpose, uh, namely being, being the place where we sleep, um, <laughs> and, uh, basically continued, continued fundraising, but also continued just, you know, calling up suppliers, calling up, you know, hiring the first people, which was interesting uh, for us because obviously you couldn't pay the interns because we, the only thing we had was student debt. <laughs> uh, so we told them, hey, "This is gonna be a ride of your lifetime. Uh, you got our job." And um, I think after after 
having cycled to 50, 60 investors or so, um, I remember that one of the guys that, that, um, that has been a founder already that I interned with, uh, he told me during my last internship while I was, while we were, you know, going out partying in a club to, you know, it was my farewell, so to say, um, he said, you know, you're going to move to London, but if you ever decide to become an entrepreneur and not go kind of to down the corporate, corporate lifestyle, then give me a call, I'll invest in you. And safe to say he was not sober at all at that <laughs> point in time. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, you don't have anything to lose. So I dropped him an email and said, Oscar, you know, and this stuff's going to happen, by the way, very, very okay. successful. Put it on up. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you recall that particular night and what you said at 4 a.m., but, you know, uh, I actually decided to, to, to start my own company, um, which would be happy to invest. And um, he basically responded five minutes later, yes, yeah, sure, 100,000, yeah? Like, wow, crazy, that's amazing. Uh, little bit, but like, but, but shortly after I realized, damn, you know, our internet is very, very spotty, so the, the PowerPoint presentation about our business model and what we're actually doing didn't e even go through, so he didn't even know what we were doing. <laughs> Uh, and then we had a short argument, you know, should I actually send it to him because he already committed, but if he doesn't <laughs> like the idea, he'll probably, you know, have second thoughts, uh, but we said, okay, at least he should know what he's investing in. So I said, yeah, thanks so much. And by the way, if you're interested, this is what we're going to do. And then he responded again, five minutes later, and um, well, the concept actually is not too stupid. It makes sense. So count me was 200,000. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so this is how he raised the first 200,000 that. And from, from that moment in time, it was a bit like domino stones falling because, um, you know, um, the, the whole process got, got its own speed and accelerated quickly. He took, he had to tell his, his board and his investors that he, um, that he, uh, wants to invest because he needed to get board approval. And then the board got intrigued by it. The board reached out to us, uh, wanting to invest. Then the competitors of, of those VCs actually, you know, uh, heard that they are looking at this concept, so reached out to us as well. And then I think by the end of the week, you raised close to a million okay. euros and we're oversubscribed. Yes. So that's how quickly things can actually change in the world of, of investing in VC. Uh, that is, if, if you have the first one or two who are really uh, into it, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's easier. Um, and I think up until this very day, fundraising is more and are than than a science and it's a lot about psychology and how how you get how you get things going yeah um no but that that's actually how, how we did how we did the fundraise and by that moment in time we were already pretty far already with the process of you know signing suppliers putting up the website for us one of the first things that we really focused on in the very beginning is we said we, we are very young we're like 22 23 year old years so we'll not win by getting mo being the most senior by having the most uh, having the most, uh, you know, uh, biggest track record and best network or most money or whatsoever. The only thing that really speaks to us is, uh, and speaks for us is, you know, um, working really, really hard seven days a week up until midnight and actually being really, really quick and, 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 and having speed. And I think this is what we try to use to our advantage and, um, and, you know, pushed very, very hard. Um, and, um, and actually, uh, you know, just, just launched the website, I think not even after eight weeks. So after eight weeks, we had a website launch, we had our first sales. And then from that on, we decided very early on to do a weekly reporting for our investors, not mm -hmm. really because we, 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 uh, our investors demanded, but we, because it held us very accountable because we wanted really to push and um, increase revenues every single week, increase all the KPIs every single week. And I remember, you know, sometimes on Sundays, we're like, we still need five orders to actually uh, to actually uh, get the 20% week on week growth. And then we started calling friends, relatives, posting it somewhere. Hey, can, and then, you know, this is, this is the non-scalable things that we did in the very beginning to really get, get traction. Uh, and um, and yeah, that that worked out. That worked out quite well, I think, uh, in, in the first few weeks and months. Yeah. 
Mm. And then actually in less than one year, you realize an exit of like 10 million. Um, so yeah. I, I think uh, I mean, at that was, time, it, yeah. at, at that time you were like 23. <laughs> so yeah. again, how does that feel as a 23 year old getting a proposal for a 10 million exit? Were you totally overwhelmed? Actually looking back to yeah. it, was it the right decision to exit at that point or should you have stayed independent longer? How, how do you look back at it? Yeah, well, well, uh, the, the the background story is obviously a bit different because we didn't really like you can't really plan for for an exit, mm. right? We have no we had even no idea what an exit is. We just wanted to build a great company, right? And um, think we basically, um, you know, went, went in this short amount of time through really tremendous growth. You know, we had two hundred fifty thousand people signed up. Um, we basically, I remember around Christmas, we actually had. To go to the warehouse to really package ourselves so that all the products would arrive on time. Um, we didn't have heating in the logistics warehouse, so that was really cold. And and then um, basically in January we said, uh, and this was five six months in, basically went out and uh, tried to raise another round. And uh, because we had to raise some investors, they introduced us to a few VCs, and um, we very quickly, I think, four weeks got term sheet. Yeah, so so that was actually pretty mm. positive. However, then one big thing happened, um, which you said in the very beginning, is that uh, uh, Rocket actually started, uh, as they invested into another company called Westring. Mm. It was like 10 times as much finance and, um, and you know, uh, all the people who had like 20 years of experience. Uh, but we are actually bigger at that point in time, you know, okay. with, with 10% of the funding, uh, we're actually bigger than them. And um, they basically... Um, what they actually said is okay, um, but the positioning was also a bit different. You know, they mm. were very much uh, um, catering to forty-five-year-old plus with very classic designs, and we are this loud, young design design type of uh, a brand, and that was catering to to kind of this Facebook generation back then. Facebook was the TikTok of these days, right? Young yeah. and hip. Uh, <laughs> need to put that as a disclaimer, yeah. you know, because we're in twenty three now. Um, and um, and they basically in general decided to just copy our website one on one, mm. you know, uh, even with all the source code and and T's and C's and so forth. And we knew that this is not going to be super successful because they were just you know not with the heart in it, and it was just a side project for them. But uh, for the investors, they're very risk averse. Back then, Rocket was you know yeah. this crazy thing, you know, where even Airbnb or others were like scared to actually compete. Um, and then the two, three investors that actually gave us a term sheet were like, hey guys, you know, we have to reconsider. Uh, we have to renegotiate. And uh, this was literally two two weeks uh, after they gave us the term sheet, but also two weeks before okay. we ran out of money. Uh, okay. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, but wouldn't you still be interested to invest? And obviously they, they got cold feet. Um, and at the same time, um, a U.S. company actually saw that and um, Fab.com that actually ended up buying us and said, you mm. know what, we, we, are, we are growing so quickly in the U.S. We don't want Rocket to actually own the, the market mm. and uh, went to Berlin. And uh, by that time, there was three, four, five companies uh, in that space. So they interviewed uh, or like talked with everyone and very quickly settled on just wanting to work with us and said, you know what, guys, we just raised 40, 50 million. That's more than you could ever raise, you know, with, mm. at a, as a 23 year old, even like back then, I think no single company in, the, in, in Europe actually raised that much money. And uh, the deal was, you know what, um, we're going to give you 50% of that fundraise, you know, um, just to build the European business. Um, Europe should be as big as, 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 as the US. You're going to run this together with us. So let's, let's do it. And um, this made perfectly sense for us, you know. Um, and um, I think the the, the number that, uh, that 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 you quoted, so so we didn't do a cash deal. So we basically at this point not 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 hundred percent of a cash deal. So back then, I think we got shares in, in the new consolidated group, but it was not yeah. for us, so to say, cash or exit event. But we basically said, okay, we believe in the vision. Company is now valued. Altogether, both companies maybe 100, 100, 150 million or so, 
and um, let's let's make this a billion dollar business. Yeah, and um, this is I think well, the, this was for us the, the the main motivation to be part of something bigger uh, that that uh, can be one of the you know first unicorns. Uh, and I think um, that's what we also achieved. I think one one year in afterwards. Yep. Yeah? So I okay. think after Amazon. After Amazon, uh, Fab and Zappos, Fab was kind of third e-commerce uh, uh, unicorn. Um, two years, two years in, yeah. And uh, this was yeah. of course very exciting for us to be part of that. Yeah, Roman, as a as a guy that came into it with the passion to build yeah. and to be an entrepreneur, um, now you're still super young and idealistic and motivated, and now you've become not the top of the food chain in your little company, but somewhere slightly below that in a much larger company. How yeah. did your kind of experience change from being really the founder and the driver to now being a cog in a much bigger machine? It really sucked, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that one before. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, uh, um, on the positive side, this was still a startup that we sold to, right? So this was not like a big corporate. So, um, but, but of course, um, you know, it, um, so, so things were still going quick and things moved, moved along quickly, but, um, it definitely is, is, is a big change in, in mindset and mentality, right? So, uh, up, up until this very point, uh, you're really making, you, you know, the, your business best, and that's why you can make the decisions in, in the best way. And then you kind of have to get a lot of approvals for, you know, things where you're like, come on guys, you know, you, you're just slowing us down and, um, I'll, are you going to make this approval 6,000 kilometers, 8,000 kilometers away without knowing actually the business? And, um, I think that that was at least my perspective back then. Obviously now in hindsight, you somehow need to have like streamlined processes and, and, and things like that. But, but it, it definitely, uh, was a lot of clashes around processes and so on and, and how to get it, how to get structure into the organization and um, without slowing it down too much and yeah we had we had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of clashes also because our company culture was very much around um speed and numbers you know whu school yeah <laughs> yes. uh, and the the the, the 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 fab company culture was very uh, classic us um us consumer focus which was it's all about the brand We'll worry about the numbers later and so forth. And I remember, you know, we had uh, really mental breakdowns because we, we you know, th there's a shopping club model. So we'd have a newsletter every single day. And then I think one day we did like an anniversary newsletter also where we kind of celebrated our one year anniversary. And we had like some faces of employees and to us it looked like very authentic. And then I got this call from the, the, the fab call founder all the guys that I see as faces on this email should be fired. This is horrible. And he was very emotional about it. Like I can't fire 25 people now. It's because their faces feature in the newsletter. And then they flew over. We had to bring everyone into this conference room in the hotel and people were like, and so it was, it was definitely a big clash. Um, and that's also the time when I said, okay, I can't really do this for longer, you know? Uh, I use a big fan of opportunity cost for the concept of it. Or basically, basically said I'm going to leave and, and get involved with with uh, new things because I had already back then a lot of new ideas about what can be launched and what should be launched. Yeah. And and out of curiosity, what was his problem with the 25 people in the newsletter? What was, what was the issue? From his point of view, it was off brand. Mm. It was off brand. <laughs> okay. The whole newsletter design <laughs> and the faces of the people. <laughs> okay. This is an in interesting topic. It's just one that I'm passionate about being half American, half German and having built companies on both sides. There is a big kind of difference, I would say, in the way a lot of businesses are operated. Although maybe thanks to the blitzscaling era that started to maybe even out a little bit more. But I'm curious, like in hindsight of that experience, 
are there things that you experienced in the American model that you would take with you? Are there things from the German model you wish you would see more in the American context? Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm always fascinated in that learnings when you're, you're straddling the ocean that way. Yeah. No, look, I think, um, um, I obviously thought about that a lot as well. I think, um, um, the, the U S mindset works really well for, uh, for, um, industries and business models, but you have a leeway on the margin side. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, that's where the brand really comes into play. That's where you can hire a lot of people, be it engineers or whatsoever to kind of double down on investing in technology. Um, you know, um, it works really well for business models that have network effect, think the Ubers of the world, but you know, yes, you invest, 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 but then once you won the market, you can, you can kind of, uh, you know, start in increasing your margins. Um, I think that's, that's where the focus on brand and technology and doubling down and winning, winning with a lot of money, um, works well. I think kind of very narrowly coming to kind of, for instance, consumer brands, which I kind of did the past 10 plus years, so most of the time, that's why you have to rewind the trust of customers and consumers every six, 12 months. It's a lot about processes and structure and, um, and let's face it, you know, you, the, the margins are not great. So if you could, I think that's where, uh, yes, you, 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 you know, things like branding and how you position, how you do start time do matter, but, um, but they're kind of the icing on the cake. You still first have to get your margins and your operations and, and all of that, right. I think um, up until this very day, if you look at a lot of this, those D2C consumer brands in the US, none of them were really a success. They were very mm. hype. You know, the hypers, blue aprons and, you know, honest mm. food of the world, they, you know, uh, away the luggage brands. So they're all, all birds. So they all raised hundreds of millions, but um, their HR costs are more than their revenue. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, and that's a very different mindset. So I think, um, so I think it, it's, uh, so for, for kind of uh, consumer brands, we have to be very efficient, uh, uh, can be tricky. Yeah. But that's also one of the learnings that I just mm -hmm. had on the way. Um, right. And, yeah. It's easier to say now than yeah. Hindsight uh, is 2020, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you, you find, you eventually step out of fab. And uh -huh. I guess this was 2012, 2013. And if yeah. I understand correctly, there wasn't a lot of break in there before you got back into the founder saddle again. Yeah. So I think I'd, I did, um, um, so, so I did one week of, of, uh, of holidays in the, in the Maldives. And then I was on day number four, I was like, damn, this is so <laughs> bad. I don't have internet. <laughs> Can't really check my emails. You know, before I had like three, four hundred emails. And, um, and then I uh, went back and, um, I started doing my first angel investments. So, um, so I was just, you know, good, um, even then without really overthinking it. Um, then, um, that's number one. Number two is I had actually, um, a few ideas in, in the back of my mind and I couldn't really execute all of them. So, um, I had, I had one girl from that was interning with me from our business school and she kind of wrote me, I said, okay, every week you have to write a different business plan for a different business idea. And kind of, uh, the first one was, uh, and you know, the, the first ideas were around thin offs of what we did with fab, basically or focusing on, on verticals. And, um, one of the things that, that, um, she came up with was the, the best selling, um, best selling, uh, uh, campaign that we had was actually vibrators. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, uh, I, I went into the office where there's been a lot of, um, th there was the former Springstar office where, you know, Airbnb was hosted, but also a few entrepreneurs were working on their, on the ideas. And I met another guy, Sebastian Pollock, who's actually, you know, just moved back from San Francisco and said, you know, I want to do something, but I have no idea what I want to do something in the healthcare space or there. And then we were just discussing it and I said, you know what, I just had one girl who works on this, on this topic and it's been working really well for fab so far. It's been a very male dominated industry, but we position, you know, fab customers are 80% female. So maybe there's something to it. And, um, so first reaction of course, from everyone was like, no, we can't really do that. Um, but then, then I think, um, 
it kind of grew on him and then also on me. And I said, you know what? Um, I'll take most of the money that I had from the first exit. If you're really up to do that, um, I'll, I'll just invest all of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's how, how basically, um, he became the, 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 the founder and I had a founding investor of, uh, of Anu Ali. Um, also a lot of learnings on the way, basically a week after I transferred the money, we realized that Facebook and Google blocked all of our accounts because it's not allowed to mm. advertise. I'm like, damn, okay, I can write that off right away. Uh, then we realized the months in that um, that uh, investors cannot invest into into this category, right? Mm. Because back then, not now it's obviously you would position it as femtech and everyone would invest in it. <laughs> but back then it was like, okay, weapons, drugs, sex doesn't work. Uh, we had, I think, in the beginning, two, three other co-founders who all kind of because of that stepped down. Okay. Uh, so out of four or five people that started, it was just uh, Sebastian and Leo who stayed on. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was it, it was definitely a big ride in in, in the first six months, and and you know it took way way longer to exit that business. Not one year, but two years. Yes, after two years, <laughs> we sold it to Pozzini <laughs> Zadan. Um, but yeah, it, it was definitely de- definitely an interesting um, moment in time. In the meantime, I already and um, I think that there was. Um, so, so I think Amaroli was end of 2012. So I, I left that in 2012, end of 2012. That's when we kind of also started uh, brainstorming the idea. of Amaroli got started in Q1 2013. And then I think I actually um, already worked in parallel on Lizara, um, mm. which which started in summer 2013. Yeah, And where we went live in September. Yeah, because I, I have year, a question yeah. about that because I was looking at your your biography mm-hmm. on LinkedIn. Yeah. And so then I indeed see uh, your founding investor in Amelie Rui, then you start Lizara. And then I also saw on your website uh, that you give some recommendations to uh, future founders and you're saying focus is everything. You should focus on one yeah. thing <laughs> and execute perfectly. Yeah. And then I like, but this guy is having two <laughs> startups at the same time. Mm-hmm. And now he's saying to other people that they should focus. That didn't seem very consistent to me. I mean, I, a good point, but I think um, the, the the main thing there is that you need to know what you focus on, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So for, for me, the the focus was really on building, so I didn't do okay. anything. And obviously, the the focus also didn't um didn't um uh, you know kind of cross change based on your priorities. But for me, it was really about I had so many ideas in in my mind, and I really that's okay. Um, I want to invest and build mainly in the e commerce and consumer space because that's where I want to. Okay where I see a lot, where I do a lot, and this is kind of my focus. Mm-hmm. So the, the focus can be as broad, as narrow as you define it for yourself. But once you kind of know what you want to focus on, that's, I think, what what what, what you're going to do. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that it's hard to be, um, um, at least in young ages, the, the CEO of two, three, mm-hmm. four companies. So for me, I was all, always only CEO of one business, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I know that uh, nowadays with the, the Jack Dorsey, Sunny Elon Musk of the world, uh, it's become in vogue <laughs> to do at least two or three companies at the same time. And I understand how they do it. Yeah, they basically just, did, you know, are more executive chairmen than, than than CEOs. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, but yeah, so so um, it's not necessarily a contradiction. Yeah, but, okay. Roman, okay. I had uh, I had Polly on the podcast last year, so I heard a yeah. little bit of this story from from his perspective, and and it was. Uh, it's a great story, of course, but um, yeah, and I, he's obviously way more uh, insights and details because he he was really on the front line of all of that stuff. Yeah, right. Right. I, I'm curious. I got though. the rejections only second hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, did were there some mechanics or some lessons from Cascanda that you ended up that kind of unfolded in Amorali? You know, we were talking about focus, but I think there's this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a kind of like being able to maximize efficiency by taking lessons and experiences from the previous venture and roll it into the second one. Was that, uh, right. did, did Cascanda influence the trajectory of, uh, Amorali? Um, I mean, you, you'd have to ask him, um, but, but, um, I think, well, you know, in, we, we wanted it to be more, um, of shared learnings. 
But the business model was very, very uh, different in a way because we are, remember, we are like a shopping club. So it was really a lot of push marketing. Yeah. So, you know, we had people sign up and then we were pushing, pushing, pushing things that they didn't even know they need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a lot about discovery and, you know, discounts. Whereas Amorelli, it was uh, in the beginning just buying brands, selling and, and selling them. But um, the, the challenges were different ones. So it was in the beginning, in, initially a lot of pull. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Google search, so very different marketing channels. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, challenge on the consumer side was also a different one. For us, it was more about price and uh, brand and, and you know, why do you need that product? Family was really more about trust, you know? Uh, you know, I remember a conversation that said, okay, uh, kind of need to uh, need to make the packaging as anonymous as possible. Mm -hmm. Whereas for Fav, we said, okay, we need to make it as loud as possible yeah. so that if you, are, if you see a DHL, uh, you know, uh, a guy, you right away see, okay, this is a fat package and it has like this big bra branding appeal. Whereas there it's like, you don't want your neighbors to know what, where you are uh, <laughs> from. Right. So, so in a way, um, the way the cost that how to think about things were similar, but the insights and learnings are almost opposite. Right. Yeah. Because uh, it was a very, very different uh, uh, positioning. Uh, but I, I yeah. suppose the the linkage between Casa Kanda and Lizara were much bigger, not because I think they're yeah. They're, so that that was it was much bigger, and so um, because it's also very much push marketing driven, um, and um, you know it, it it was also in initially the concept of showing people things that they not necessarily know they they need, right? Mm. Um, and that kind of, you know, drills down to the marketing channel. So it was also very much social media focused and, um, and, um, and push marketing focused. And uh, the challenge was always about creating newness. You know, we had, uh, I think at the peak, 2000 new SKUs every single week that we push. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, remember these are not things that we buy. These are things that we design, create produce and then sell. So it was a, a bit of a different challenge there. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, okay. uh, this Go is ahead. one of the cra craziest kind of two to three year <laughs> journeys <laughs> I've, I think I've ever heard before. So, I mean, you found Cascana within a year, you exit, you join fab in the meantime, you, you are a catalyst for the start of a morally. And then within the same year or within a year, you start yet another company. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that that uh, definitely. I, I did not take a lot of rest. Yeah, <laughs> um, but that that's the beauty of being young. I think now uh, everyone that's kind of young, I think, just all you know, uh, you don't have anything to lose. Uh, just 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 keep pushing and trying. I think also in entrepreneurship, it's. I mean, you know the data better than me, but um, ninety percent of the things fail. Yeah, I think for me, I was fortunate enough that. You know, out of the first two, three things, actually two things materialized. Um, but um, the, 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 the more you try, the more things actually work out. Of course, the more failures you'll also have, but uh, you, you, you know, the more things also work out. That's, that's the good thing about one side, one side bets, you know, one sided bets. You can only lose your time in a way, but you, if you win, you actually win big. Yeah. Because I want to briefly touch upon that because I have a, a Garrett is saying these two, three years were, were crazy. The next two, three years, I think, were also crazy. If you just yeah. look at your biography, so Lezara was the fastest growing tech company in Europe in 2016 and 2017. You were listed in the Forbes third under 30. The German press called you the startup wunderkind. And then I'm thinking like, my God, this guy is in his 20s. And, and he's getting all these praise, all the success, but, but I, at least I would think that you might also fear this, what is called imposter syndrome, that you're thinking like, oh, what is happening to me from the outside? It looks so great, but, but I, I would imagine that somewhere there is also kind of uncertainty. Can you go briefly back to that time and, and how you personally felt about getting all this exposure as this huge success kit? that was kind of driving the, the German tech ecosystem. How did that feel? Yeah. I mean, uh, also there, I, I would love to give you a super smart answer, but, um, we are just so focused on, 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 on building that. Um, I think for us, we, we probably leveraged, um, a bit of the PR for kind of recruiting purposes. Okay. 
but um, but it was never something that that we were really super actively seeking out. Mm. It just happened, mm. and um, for us, you know, we are always very internally focused on um, you know what can we do to actually grow faster, improve, and um, you know hire the right talent and the right people. So um, that was kind of the thing that we most obsessed about. And, um, you know, the, the, the rest you can't really, the things that you can influence, you can't influence, right? So, no, uh, no but I, I would oh, also was, think yeah. that this kind of, uh, if you're selected as the most fast yeah. growing company, that kind of thing, that it, yeah. it triggers a feeling of responsibility. Like, okay, I'm now no longer allowed to fail because I feel that would kind of have negative spillovers to the whole community. Did did you feel like that, or were you just too busy with your with growing that you didn't think about that kind of stuff? Yeah, no, I, I, I think because of um, I mean, back then already a lot of e-commerce and consumer um, stops were not um, were anyways not not the um, hottest stuff, right? Um, mm. So it was not like we like uh, our branch or vertical was was uh, getting a lot of praise in the tech industry right okay. so it was a lot about fintech or you know oh my god look at social networks or look at those apps and um so i think um some of those awards were rather important for the team to get a bit of um because they were very factual based you know based on revenue growth based on kind of customer satisfaction and so on and so forth there was more um for that for, for the team important to to also get a bit of um total appreciation for what they're doing um versus anything else yeah? yeah okay but of course it comes uh with that comes a lot of responsibility but i would say uh we didn't like we we had already before that even without mm -hmm. this uh, responsibility for employees for customers yeah. for investors for everything in all the companies mm -hmm. and um it's one of those things that if you uh, uh, um if you constantly obsess about it then no good because decisions will come out of it yeah. because if you kind of every morning going to the office with all the chips on your shoulders then uh, that's not going to lead to the best decision so you kind of have to um have to uh, be a bit emotionally uh, detached from it um uh, to, to make the best decisions in the interest of everyone okay. what was your how was a different raising capital for lasara than the previous um, companies with the success you had already had where was that relatively easy in comparison yeah i i think um i think the first one or two rounds for sure mm -hmm. i think from series a onwards it's yeah. uh in any case a lot about traction and yeah. numbers and and um you know um and positioning in a way Mm -hmm. um but the first one or two rounds were definitely significantly easier you know you you rather have to manage okay who do you get in strategically why and um, you know how, how to make the best out of it but remember i think to 213 to 14 um when we did kind of those first two races it was not at the it was not the golden years of, of team money right so i think mm -hmm. that really just changed in two 220 basically yeah. right 290 so so i think uh 220 21 22 that was kind of where 10x uh of of that amount was invested mm -hmm. uh, back then it was it was it was still not that easy yeah. mm -hmm. so i don't know if i i have the full story right but if i understand yeah. correctly it was access to capital in the end that uh you know led to the the end of lazar yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so I think it was it was two things. So so um, maybe to kind of uh, do to do an executive summary, I think um, we have been growing into like top line and getting kind of uh, kind of kind of customer demand was never the the, the big uh, the big challenge, so to say. Yeah, um, because uh, on not such a big challenge because you had like very attractive positioning. You kind of uh, um, you know we we also repositioned it a bit from being an almost everything store to being more focused on apparel and lifestyle products, but closer to what, for instance, indie text that Sarah group is doing, or nowadays she in, which is kind of the highest valued, uh, 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 or I think one of the two or three highest yeah. valued uh, private companies. Uh, yeah. And depending on if they do a dollar now or not 60 to hundred billion. Um, and, um, and I think so, so that was always, always good. And then we, I think at some point in time did a very, uh, 
cautious decision because we are always competing with um, AliExpress or Shein back mm. back then already. And we said, okay, we cannot um, we cannot compete with them solely on on uh, price because they are heavily subsidized by the Chinese government. They don't pay taxes here, and uh, they also don't pay customs. Um, so it's basically borderline illegal what they're doing mm. and we cannot compete on that as a European company. So we kind of need to invest into quality and service. And I think that's where, that's what triggered a lot of, uh, street, uh, that, that strategic decision triggered also investment. Mm. And that includes investment in Maine and China. So we actually ended up going from just doing sourcing there to designing products, to doing quality control, to actually creating a warehouse there where we were shipping in two, three working days to consumers. Um, so, um, and that also triggered investments in, 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 in Europe on the distribution center side. And we had a pretty frank discussion with our board where we said, okay, if we want to do this, you invest at this location, if we want to do this, these are the investments that we, that we need to do. Um, we know that none of you are kind of soft bank or tiger and investing hundreds of millions, but uh, we kind of need that commitment. So, mm. um, and I think everyone signed off on that. And I think, um, you know, after three, four really good years, so to say, after we made those investments, investment decisions, 2018 was kind of the first year where we had one or two quarters that were not really really great and where we didn't have 100% year on rear growth but maybe just 20 30 years or so yes um and um that kind of created this this uh, this uh, dilemma where we already had a lot of the investments done we didn't have a lot of uh, you know um fun and backers that could really financially uh, uh you know uh, fund us unlimited almost yeah mm. and we had kind of this uh, very strong uh, competition from china doubled down exactly at that point in time um with with uh, the investment um and i think that in the end it was kind of a negative perfect storm where where uh, you know we we obviously were fighting and going left and right to kind of figure, figure things out but it was a so to say for us a negative perfect storm um the one thing that that um, you know is in a way interesting is that a lot of other Western companies who are in the same spot, so for instance, or in a similar spot. So I'll give you an example: Wish dot com, for instance, yeah. was a mar marketplace, but but um, not kind of not not a retail model, but a marketplace, but going into the same demographic, and they are pretty big back then as well. IPO for I think eight nine billion, because they had some investors who could carry them until the IPO, mm -hmm. never made a profit. I think they kind of struggled from from um, it, it, it's the strategic decision that we did to invest in quality and they didn't do, and they now struggle uh, mm -hmm. because I think now they're based back to kind of sub sub a few hundred million in 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 market cap and you mm -hmm. know went down ninety five percent plus. Mm -hmm. Same thing for a company called Normal Rack that was doing seven hundred million revenues and went bust. So I think um, I think it's 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 really hard. Um, in that to compete in that space, if uh, your competitors are heavily subsidized Chinese mm -hmm. uh, companies, yeah. So, so I think that's also one one of the learning uh, uh, for us. And yeah? mm -hmm. um, fun fact actually was that um, in 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 the in the final quarter, so in the final month, we we're actually in in discussions with Xi'an, right? Because we okay. knew them they were in the same space in Guangzhou, um, and they flew over with the whole team uh, to meet us, and we are kind of debating and discussing and um you know shortly before christmas they were actually giving us an an, an offer um so an acquisition yes. offer um uh, and, and i'm telling this to kind of sh showcase you how 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 close really big success like in the case of kind of kind of fair probably mm. and 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 failure are because gave us an offer and we're obviously extremely happy it was a cash offer and then they realized afterwards that they can't really move that much money out of China because mm -hmm. China's capital control so it says okay you know what uh, we're going to change it a bit we're going to give you a bit of cash and a bit of equity in Xi'an okay you know what why not I think the company was back then valued one or two billion or so so mm. uh, we would have gotten a decent chunk and the deal eventually didn't materialize because um, because and that might sound strange now 
but because of uh, data privacy concerns, because they obviously needed access to all the database of our two, two and a half million customers. And in Germany, there's been, you know, we had it checked legally from their side, from our side, it would have been very, very tricky to transfer that IP and mm. that, that, uh, that domain to, to China. And that's eventually how we did not materialize on a billion dollar deal. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that, that shows you kind of, kind of how, how, um, for every single company and, and, um, you know, you, uh, think you can ask a lot of honors. Uh, for every single company, you have near death experiences, and sometimes it's really, really small external factors that mm -hmm. can make the difference between yeah. making it and not making it. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's, it's very, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, because actually, if you look a bit at the press at that time, it was really framed as a failure. Also, to be honest, yeah. for you personally, it was framed as a failure. Yeah. So, as you would see in 2016, 2017, you were seen as the wunderkind, and then two years later, and as you describe, eh, having a close call between a huge success yeah. and a failure, you're suddenly seen as the, the, the wunderkind falling down from the cliff. Yeah. Again, how, how, how do you experience that? Or are you simply like, I don't care about that? The, the, for no, me, that would I be difficult to believe, but... Yeah, no, I think obviously I, you have to separate between the emotions in that particular moment and then kind mm. of looking at it in hindsight. I think, to, to be super frank... Um, I think um, and, uh, it's uh, so, so in this particular moment, you're also mainly functioning because you still have responsibility, right? So it's mm. not like you, you're almost on autopilot mode um, and trying to make the right decisions for the team and obviously uh, uh, for kind of the employees. And there's a lot of stuff that where we had to kind of uh, uh, fix lo lo loose heads and, and, and you know. Um, but at the same time, I mean, sometimes you have sleepless nights because you have so much work. Obviously, there you have sleepless nights because you have so much concerns. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, so definitely, I think it, it takes a toll on your mental health one hundred percent, right? Because, yeah. but, but not in that particular day, but even the month before. I don't know, sometimes it's almost a relief when you say, "Okay, now you worked so hard. That's the best we can do." And and um and 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 um and um, yeah not now now that's it but um it is is definitely tough yeah uh, it's definitely tough i think um in in high, like t hindsight 2020 i think um what well, what you can definitely like one of the big learnings that that i also saw because i remember a presentation from from Oli Zambro at university this was again you know, to, to A, to 9, to 10, when, when he said, you know, if he has to decide between a triple A idea and a B team and a triple A team and a, and a B idea, he would always go for the triple A idea and a mm. B team. And I was like, okay. ah, why? Mm. It doesn't make sense. Um, but then, you know, once you've been going through a few business models and a few, you know, companies, um, you know, it, a lot of the success also depends on timing and external factors that you can't really in or, and the business model that you can't really influence once you once you go down that path, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say from a lot of the companies that I've been involved with, this was probably one of the top one or two setups in terms of team and skill and culture and so on and so forth. But we were just uh, playing in the wrong game or in the wrong field at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. I think um, having having that having that um, insight or having that understanding of how the business world works gives you also a bit of peace of mind at some point in time because it's sometimes it works out well, sometimes sometimes it doesn't. And as long as you kind of worked very, very hard and didn't give up on the particular particular, you know, business, then uh, then it's not always hundred percent in your hands. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting what you said about Ali Samwar and this you know, yeah. this decision between great idea and okay team and, and vice versa. But I, I actually want to ask you a, a little bit more about this concept of failure, even though I, I'm putting that in air quotes, because I think it's sometimes it's difficult for people to differentiate between the failure of a company and the, the failure of a founder. But this is one of the questions I've asked other guests on this podcast before, because I've heard similar things like you heard from Ali Samwar about failed entrepreneurs. Uh, I know you 
make investments now you had you started with like success after success then you had a business that didn't go the right way what is your ethos would you rather invest in a young entrepreneur that has never done anything or only had success or would you prefer to invest in an entrepreneur that has faced failure before um well i think um uh, uh it I mean, ideally, I would always invest in, in someone who is uh, who is positive energy and you know has has the mental res resilience to go through the ups and downs. I think obviously, a person that has already gone through some struggles um, has a bit more experience with that, right? It doesn't mean that someone who hasn't, like a first time entrepreneur, won't get there. But of course, there's a certain risk, right? I did also a few investments where. Uh, People just uh, gave up too quickly, right? And and look, sometimes um, who am I to judge if it's the right decision or not? Because you know, sometimes if if you if you know that you're kind of uh, going down and dead end, um, and you think about the constant opportunity cost, then you need to get up. But but I, I feel that a lot of times um, people just do it too early, yeah. And you have to kind of find your way through. And obviously, someone who has gone through some struggles and is a bit more. Um, you know, uh, uh, experienced with that would definitely be uh, would definitely be the, the the safer choice as long as he's still hungry and ambitious and, and wants to go the extra mile. I think that that's something of of course that that you also need to take into account. So so since uh, since those last days of Lazara, yeah. that's been about yeah. five years now. Can you give us a four, little yeah four and a half? Can yeah. you give us a little yeah. bit of a summary of where? Uh, where the journey has taken you since then? Yeah, look, I think f f for me, um, again, then I didn't have a lot of break because um, I took some break because obviously the, the more the, than the one week or <laughs> how much yeah, time this time? Yeah. <laughs> no, in that case, I think it was two, three months, but I think okay, I definitely okay. needed it. I definitely yeah, I needed can imagine. it because <laughs> what you don't realize in those 10 years of building, you're always like online adrenaline, like a bit like a marathon runner or like an extreme athlete. And you're not missing something. You're not missing anything in the process of of, of, of running. But afterwards, you feel mm. oh, that drains so much energy, mm. uh, mentally, physically. That I need to I need to need to kind of take a break. And to be mm. honest, um, uh, the the first natural reaction uh, is a bit like uh, the reaction of an addict. You know, after a month, you're like, okay, or a week in my case, sometimes you're like, okay, I didn't get any emails. Uh, I'm not doing anything. Let's start something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this kind of, uh, you have to sometimes fight that urge because a lot of people, and I know a few serial entrepreneurs now, everyone has it. <laughs> so kind of getting out of your company, you know, this urge to kind of get get into onto the pitch again. Yeah. And in my case, I think in, in that particularly, and in 2019, um, um, I think after two, three months, um, um, well, one of my, um, all my employees were invested in Sebastian. He, he did. He was uh, back then already, uh, you know, um, scaling his his D two C brand Fitvia. Where I was, mm -hmm. uh, he did basically just one round with me and another angel, and uh, he was one of my first uh, interns at uh, Fab slash Kazakanda. That's by the way a pattern that um, you'll see also now developing um, and or already developed there. That I really like to, um, in kind of hire people who think entrepreneurial. So the best choice is if they actually end up doing something entrepreneurial afterwards. And a lot of companies and people that I'm involved with now have been working with me at my previous companies. Mm -hmm. And Sebastian was one of the first ones he was interning and you know, basically said they had probably the same conclusion that I had when I interned. He said, if, if, if this guy can do it, I can do it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he started uh, his, his, his own and he was one of the first pioneers for um, for um, no D two C consumer brands that scale via via influencers and creators, what you call now creators, and that business uh, was was a company called Fitbia. So they sold first uh, um, beverages, tea on uh, via creators, and then actually beauty products with Bella via in 2019. And so that's uh, when I was already invested for four years in. Um, basically sat together and he said, okay, let's, let's structure, uh, let's structure a process where we sell the company. Um, and, and that's where, where, you know, I was, uh, I was kind of assisting and helping him with, he hired obviously an advisor 
And um, after, I think in the summer, around the summertime, we actually ended up selling the business um, to uh, to a German stockless company, Dermafarm. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, where, that's where I realized, you know what, a lot of the things that actually I've, I've been doing um, for a particular vertical make much more sense for categories that are highly profitable, have high margins, and where you can actually scale the same type of business with the same machinery, so to say, and processes, um, but in a profitable way, in a capital efficient way. Um, and so since then, I think, um, so that, that exit was in 2019. Okay. And then since then, I actually, um, you know, focused a lot on both working as a founding investor or as a normal, just angel investor, um, to kind of co-found or invest into businesses that, that are coming kind of from, 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 from that space. And um, I think the first in, in 2020, we basically launched uh, two companies. One was with uh, two former employees of mine, um, San and Veronica, uh, a company called Tiapura, where I was a founding investor, which is basically a, a yeah, D2C, uh, a consumer brand for Korean beauty. So Korean beauty is kind of the next mm-hmm. thing after K-pop and mm-hmm. Korean fashion uh, and Squid Games, K- K-movies. <laughs> uh, um, and um, really, really uh, impressive execution. I think this is going to be a company that probably that, like that doesn't make a lot of noise in the investor world, but um, that's because they they've been profitable since the second year okay. um, and growing really crazy, and we have a lot of things coming up there. So it's a company that's now present in Germany, Italy, Spain, France. We launched in UK in this month. Um, we launched a male brand. So yeah, but as a brand for females, we launched a male brand looking to get into retail and create and do our own stores. So kind of the, the, all, a lot of the credit consumer brands go from having a single brand on, on, on Instagram towards multi channels or selling on Amazon, having their own stores, going into retail, um, and also going multi-brand. Um, so that's one company another company in the cosmetic space called Happy Glam, which we now merged as well and very kind of sustainable, uh, yeah, beauty and lifestyle uh, holding. Um, so, so those are, for instance, two, two consumer brands in the beauty space, um, one holding, which is called Berlin and, and a brand house Berlin, um, which is basically doing the same in the apparel space. So we create their community based uh, fashion brands. Um, for instance, a company in which is a brand which is big in in, um, in the el- electronic uh, fashion scene, yeah, Vertebelin, um, and those are also former employees of mine. So kind of holdings that create great brands in, in their verticals. So I think that's something that uh, over the past uh, two three years we've been scaling quite quite a bit. Uh, can can I um, maybe give you briefly yeah. a pushback because now yeah. that you make the list, I hear you saying, okay, yeah. these were former employees of mine, these were former employees yeah. of mine. And before you were saying I invest or I should invest in great ideas and maybe B teams, but here it seems yeah. to be actually that you're really aware of who is founding these companies. So <laughs> no, so, so so I said that in the context of what what I heard, what what I kind of received as is, is, is wisdom, so to okay. say, at okay. my university team. That and uh, um, the best case is obviously to invest in in okay. uh, a ideas and a teams, right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. if you have to kind of uh, make that decision, okay, um, then I think that the the idea is way more important. Or um, like you can have the best team in the world if they work on a not so great idea, mm. they're not gonna make it. Yeah, um, I think that was just the insight because before that I thought, okay, if you have a good team. You can figure out everything you want, and uh, you can basically just, you know, create a trillion dollar business with uh, with dinner kebab stores. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so that's not true, unfortunately. Okay, you know, at least it takes away longer. Yeah, um, because I sometimes yeah, also, also hear, yeah. I sometimes also hear, if you have a great team, they will pivot anyway to to a good idea, as long as they are a great team. That no, that that's that that's that's true, and I think. Uh, the necessity to pivot uh, is inherent in almost every business model. Mm. You know, you, you always have to iterate. You have to be quick. You have to have almost, uh, I like the concept of low ego. So, you know, where you, you, you have an idea, but if it doesn't work, if the data doesn't tell you that it works, if the customers yeah. tell you that it doesn't work, you have to change it. Mm-hmm. And um, so, so that's, that's, that's hundred percent true, but you're still stuck. Like if you, for instance, in our case with Lazara, we, we, 
we couldn't pivot to a um, social yeah. network, you know, oh, okay. uh, or we couldn't pivot to kind of a, a, a neo band. Yeah? yeah. So you're still stuck in, 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 in a particular field, in a particular vertical, mm -hmm. um, and have some sort of legacy if you're already building and having a team and, and people who bought into that vision also on their investor side. Yeah. Yeah. Clear. Yeah. So yeah. So in a nutshell, to to Gary to, to answer your question, so a, a lot of time goes on actually co-founding or being a founding investor of mm -hmm. kind of those consumer brands. And I think then um, I was very lucky, kind of, you know, with time having had a lot of access to um, to to kind of uh, both consumer brands that that I invested in. So Everdrop, for instance, from Munich, um, Wild, but also. Um, companies that we use yeah so um i think uh, my my biggest anti-portfolio is we we are one of the first customers of personio or porto which all became kind of unicorns mm -hmm. and then after i said okay you know what everything that we use as a brand as as everything that we use actually every software just gonna invest in it yeah mm -hmm. so so that has worked out quite well yeah um and uh, so so i think the, this kind of the uh, the two two things that that I focus most of the time being kind of very involved with the companies where I've been a founding investor in, and then also uh, investing and more passive like I'm still involved but more, more than business angel into into um, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, companies. We we have to wrap things up in a second, but I do want to yeah. ask you one more question about that. It's something that I've maybe questioned myself a little bit as well. Is you know, when you kind of get to that stage in your career where you can, uh, in a way, parachute into businesses, provide guidance, mentorship, or, or capital, you know, you, you start straddling the line between entrepreneur and investor. And I think everyone that's a former entrepreneur that, you know, invests in one way or the other um, wants to be closer to the entrepreneur side than the investor side. Where do you put yourself on that line right now? And how do you feel about where you stand? No, hundred percent. So I think um, I'm always saying, you know, we we have uh, basically. So I'm now 35. So I, I best case have you know another 50 years of uh, of business life, yeah. Or if I look at Warren Buffett, maybe a few more, yeah. Uh, so I don't want to move too early to the investment side because it's just um, um, you know, it's not gonna run away. Um, um, and I think for this building, for building companies, for being entrepreneurial, you still need a lot of energy, um, which you maybe don't have when you're 80. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, and it's just what make, you know, gives me the biggest pleasure and excitement and fun to actually work on ideas with, with, uh, strong founders and a bit, a bit like, how, like how I see it is that, you know, my, um, before that I had like heads off or VPs or, you know, whatever your, your, your management team and you work with them. For me, kind of the founders, the CEOs, I work the closest with them. So I have a lot of the upside of being able to talk strategically of challenging of mm -hmm. discussing, but uh, less of the downside of the things that you just can't avoid as a CEO. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're like, Hey, middle of the night, I wake up because someone, you know, did something crazy or, you know, I need to fire someone. So a lot of the, you know, fires that pop up every single day that you can control. So I think, um, it's, it's always, uh, it's a, it's a good mix uh, at this point in time. Yeah. And, and the way how I see kind of the entrepreneurial journey is, um, it, um, like a, a mix or a set of different sprints, you know, so I had maybe my first sprints were very short. Yeah. One and a half, two years, two years, four years. That's. I'm realistic about it. That's not the normal case, right? Mm -hmm. It usually takes time to develop a great business and 15 years, maybe. So I was lucky that initially I had a lot of very short, uh, um, sprints. Um, now I think I'm now four years into my, I would say company studio sprint where I basically co-found businesses and, 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 and invest and want to be really great at that. And I think it's a lot of fun, but, um, you know, Maybe in in two three years I'll do another sprint of five or ten uh, five or ten years of of uh, running a business. But I think I've less solve and um, I think the, the one thing that I learned um, I don't know if it's a good or bit bad thing, but um, um, you know of course you you get more selective about what kind of businesses you, you yeah. you're getting involved with. And I don't you know obviously back in the days if you're 22 and I had my kind of nine months 
my nine month time night uh, period i said okay after nine months i have to found found you know found a business um i'll just take the best of what's available to me at this point in time now of course um you know i don't have this time urgency so to say and you also see a lot more so i think in the past uh three four five years i've seen we've also done for instance uh um is back on, on NASDAQ and um, with a few friends that where we also looked at hundreds of businesses of unicorns and you learn so much, you also see so much and, but it makes you also uh, way more selective, which can be a good thing, can be a bad thing, but it's, you know, you can't unsee what you have seen. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Roman, again, given the time, I think we almost need to wrap it up. We always end with, with one uh, very specific question. Do you have any suggestions for a particular book or a podcast that our audience should listen to or read? Yeah. Um, look, I think, um, I have two or three things that really shaped my thinking. Um, okay. So, uh, I think uh, Nassim Taleb, you can read anything from mm -hmm. this guy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think um, one of my favorite ones is like Skin in the Game, the concept of Skin in the Game. I mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, think a bit more light, uh, but still very, very uh, predictably irrational from, from the area. I'm not sure if you heard, heard of that. No. Um, very strong, very strong book. I think uh, um, it's it's about how, you know, people are not rational and how you can actually use that in the business okay. context to mm -hmm. kind of uh, your advantage. And um, in, in, in kind of the same bracket, uh, Kahneman and Tursky, yep. uh, thinking fast and slow, mm -hmm. so I think super strong concept. So those are more kind of tougher, like a more- <laughs> That's a heavy uh, read. <laughs> theoretical <laughs> books, yeah. <laughs> I would say more more kind of entertaining ones. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a chip if, if you've read uh, Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. Oh, so yes. I think that's actually about the importance of sleep, mind blowing, eye opening. So uh, obviously, uh, I'm I'm glad that I read it in my 30s and not in my 20s. Otherwise, I don't know what what would have happened to my companies. Yeah. Um, and then um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Total Recall. So I think mm. uh, I think that that's a good one. A very, okay. I mean. Uh, it, it's I, you, you can you can think of the guy what what, what you want but um, you know it's it's very rare to succeed in one domain uh, and be the, the best person in the world in one domain which, uh, but in three domains the same life is uh, incredible yeah and so being the best bodybuilder uh, highest grossing uh, uh, actor and then a governor um, so yeah so I think it, it's uh, a lot of a lot of good concepts uh, and especially about how to approach things with your mind in in that book yeah nice. and and you're 35 Roman so you still can also have that ambition not to excel yeah, in, uh, <laughs> in three I'll, I'll see if I, I'll, I'm not sure if I want to be a politician I'll, I'll see if yeah. I work on the bodybuilding yeah? <laughs> 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 okay, awesome. Roman, thanks a lot for sharing and, and to hear your very fascinating yeah. story. And again, as a as a 45 year old, it's quite intimidating <laughs> to hear this kind of story <laughs> from a 35 year old. But that's that's my problem, not yours. Um, <laughs> so thanks for sharing every, uh, everything. And I also hope that our audience enjoyed this show. And please, if you did, don't hesitate to rate us on your favorite podcast player. And we hope to hear you again soon. Bye. Bye-bye.